Hey everybody, what's up? It's Chase. Welcome to another episode of the Chase Jarvis Live Show here on Creative Live. This is the show where I sit down with amazing humans and I unpack their brains with the goal of helping you live your dreams. Today's guest is Rachel Rogers. She's a CEO, an attorney, and a black woman, working mother, self-made millionaire, uh, absolute brilliant helping people at brilliant at helping people uncover the thing that's going to make them money. And in this conversation, we sort of peel apart some of the myths that, hey, look, uh, money is not everything. It's true. Money is not everything, but money can help you create the living and the life of your dreams. And being real about money is one of the things that defines Rachel Rogers. Uh, she's got a new book out. We talk about a new book, which is called Everybody Should Be a Millionaire. We Should All Be Millionaires, rather. Uh, a Woman's Guide to Earning More, Building Wealth, and Gaining Economic Power. Uh, in this, we share a handful of steps. It's very, very practical. That's one thing you're going to love about Rachel is it's action oriented, a uh, step by step. Uh, and whether you pick up her book or you just learn from this episode, I promise this is going to deliver a bunch of keys to unlock your personal financial freedom. So I'm going to get out of the way and, and introduce again, Rachel Rogers to the show. <music> Rachel Rogers, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. It's been a bit, right? You, we, uh, we were just talking right before we recorded about uh, you did a creative live class a couple years ago, and um, what a journey it's been. So I think the right place to start is often at the beginning. So for those folks who aren't aware of you or your work, um, maybe one or two sentences about how you describe yourself now, but then let's go back in the time capsule to Rachel as a young person. So first orient us and then, then go back to the Wayback Machine. Yes. The Wayback Machine is very important. I have a good girlfriend and she's always like, you should remind people where you came from. <laughs> she's like, do people think this is nor like this was the always the way that it was? <laughs> like, let's, let's, let's catch right, up. I just read an article for those who don't know about you making a million dollars a month. And well, I want to make sure that we don't orient people that that's where you started. You came out of the womb, just clocking a million, a million a month. Um, but give it, I was like, like the, the, the least likely person to make a million dollars in a month um, as a child and even young adult. So but I, so the way I describe myself now is I'm the CEO of Hello7, which is a company that is focused on helping women and marginalized folks build wealth and, you know, create more economic well being. So my form of activism is money and teaching people how to make more of it so that we can do good things in the world with it. And, you know, we can have fun with it too, right? We don't have to just sacrifice, we can also enjoy it. So, that's what I do now. And uh, where I started was in Flushing, Queens, New York. I grew up in New York, Queens girl. And um, to a family that was, you know, probably lower middle class and lots of different types of struggles, definitely related to employment, definitely related to finances. You know, we grew up in a, in a time where like there was a time where my parents had good jobs and they bought a condo. Right. So there was like a couple of years where they did really well. They both had good jobs. And then they got laid off and lost it all, um, the condo wow. too. And it was like, sort of like this was, they were low income and young having babies and like, you know, climbing. And then they hit a peak. They were there for maybe a couple of years and then dropped back down. So, and of course this was my childhood witnessing all of it and having, you know, uh, the people come to the door to turn off the lights. And my mom, you know, they used to, Back in the day, I don't know if you remember this, but they used to send like, they would try to get you to like join a bank or something or get a credit card or whatever. And they would send these like checks that like you could call and activate it. And then you'd have this check or whatever. This was before, I guess, people were as worried about check fraud. <laughs> but anyway, um, this doesn't pay my mother in the best light, but she would use those. Like she, like the guy comes to the door and he's about to turn off our lights and like go downstairs in our apartment building and like turn off our electricity. She doesn't have the money. So she writes one of these checks and gives it to the guy, knowing that wow. it's going to buy her two or three days. And then in two or three days, she's going to get her paycheck and be able to catch up. And I just I, I just saw that. And I actually really admired that about my mother. She's a hustler, you know, 
and she knew how to make a dollar out of 15 cents. And that's what she taught me how to do. And so just witnessing this, all of this financial struggle, all of this distress, all of the like health issues that came out of it uh, with my parents, I was very focused on making money, you know, and was like, I'm going to become a lawyer. I'm going to make good money. I'm going to take care of my mom and, and my family and myself. So that's kind of where it started. And it turned out okay. Like it's working. <laughs> <laughs> and now, yeah, quit the gritty stuff and now just jump to the posh lifestyle. You're there at the beach talking to me. <laughs> And we're wrapped. Okay, thanks for the conversation. Congrats on the book, by the way. No, no. Let's let's unpack that a little bit because even in in the story of your mom being a hustler, uh, yeah. I think we grow up, and so much of our childhood shapes who we are, uh, including mm-hmm. the stories that we tell ourselves. So, yeah. early question here: How do you how do you break out of the cycle of money is hard that you were raised with, how do you break that cycle and say, you know, money comes freely to me because I've applied my intellect, my ambition, my heart and soul into X, Y, Z. How how do you, how do you shift your mindset? I don't, did that just happen overnight? Was that some coaching or did you have to believe a myth? Like what, 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 what was able to flip that switch for you? Um, I think it was definitely a process, right? Like there was no, there was no life coaching when I was a kid. And even if there was, I wouldn't have been able to access it. Um, I didn't know about abundance mindset or even the word mindset, like was not a word (laughs) that I knew growing up. I think the thing is my, my parents had lots of struggle, but they always constantly were big encouragers and always said to me that I could be anything that I wanted, you know, and I believe them, you know, they, they really reinforced that within me and my sister. And so, you know, I believed that. And then I would watch my mom watch like crime dramas and like courtroom dramas. And I'd see the attorneys like standing up for the little guy against the big bad guy, right. Or whatever. And I was like, I want to be that person. I want to be that advocate. You know, I want to stand up for, for the little guy. Um, and so that's, that's basically what I did. You know, that's why I think I was drawn to, to the law. And I think the other part of it is, and this has always been true in my childhood and as an adult, it really wasn't optional, right? Like I didn't see it as optional. I didn't see like getting to a place of financial security as an optional thing. It was a must. It had to happen. I was going to do it one way or another. What's the best way to do it? How can I learn? And I did have examples, right? Like there were First of all, there were drug dealers like in my neighborhood. They had money. I saw their hustle and what they were doing to make money. Um, I thought it was, you know, terrible. and Exactly. But but also resourceful. Yes, exactly. And I understood that. So that was an example. Um, Also, I used to babysit a little girl named Alana. When I was like probably 15, I would go pick her up from school, walk her home. She lived in Douglaston, which is this really nice part of Queens. I would take the bus over there. As all these tree lined streets, big mansions, like beautiful houses. And, you know, her mother was so kind to me. These were the first like really nice rich people I had ever encountered because, you know, pop culture tells you rich people are terrible people. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I know I didn't know any rich people. So so like this was a way for me to like have I was in their household. Right. I opened their pantry and just like see all the snacks, like all the pizza bagels and the cereals and the things that my mother wouldn't buy because we couldn't. Um, And so just having conversations with her and and even her mother and seeing that her dad worked from home. And I was just like, wow, I never even had seen like two living rooms. Like, oh, you have more than one living room. Oh, you have like a formal dining room. Like, what, what is this room for? It's always empty, <laughs> right? Like, right. the dining room table. But you, you don't eat there, though. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I, was, I was encountering wealth and, and learning about it and wondering, like, what do y'all do for a living, right? Like, because I, I, maybe I need to study that, right, when I get older. Um, so, yeah, just, just being interested at, in money and wanting to understand it because I could see the results of not having it, you know? It's so easy for people, I think, in our culture to say money can't buy you X, Y, Z until you don't have it, Mm -hmm. until you until you don't have it. How how much of being raised without it or with it in limited supply do you feel like shaped you? Was it hundred percent, ninety percent, or did this was this something that you feel like you came to later in life? Like I need to make money if I'm going to 
create leverage in my life, be able to impact some of the causes and beliefs and like, like where, where in your psyche is this? Was this the most important thing? Was it incidental? You've, you've yeah. given us a story, but tell us overtly, like, was yeah, this a thing no. you stayed up late saying, I'm going to be wealthy enough not to think about money? For sure. I mean, from childhood, in high school, in middle school, like I was thinking about this. Um, and I don't know that I knew that other people weren't, right? Like, I, I, I probably thought everybody was thinking the same thing, you know? Uh, but it was, it was just, it was a priority, right? Figuring out what is, what is going to be my path? How am I going to do it? I know I'm going to have to take action. I know there's going to be work involved. I'm down for the work. And, you know, I used to get really good grades in school. I even in high school, <laughs> I used to write reports for other people. So like I would do their book reports or do their essays and they would pay me. Um, uh-huh. And so I was entrepreneur I, always. Right. And so, you know, at 14, I had like a job at the grocery store. And then I also had this little side hustle of writing essays for people. <laughs> and so like I just was. I always, and and now, you know, when I was uh, an adolescent, of course, I wanted to go to the Gap and buy clothes. I wanted to go buy pizza with like the cute boy. You know what I mean? Like I wanted some of those really basic things, but I also, I wanted a future. So I think I was always future focused from a child and always thinking about what am I going to do in the future? Always had really big vision, you know? Um, had no idea how I was going to get there, but always was dreaming big. Uh, and I think maybe it came from reading a lot as a kid. I used to live at the library and like read Roald Dahl and all these other books that were just whimsical and fantasy. And I think it allowed me to learn how to dream because I think that's really important too. Some of us don't even allow ourselves to imagine what we want, you know, Mm -hmm. to imagine Mm -hmm. it requires so much faith. Um, and I think that's hard for a lot of people. It's like, if it's not there in front of me, if I can't see it, I can't believe it. And I'm like, well, it was never in front of me. So it always had to be faith, you know? Uh, let's unpack that for a second. I think there's a lot there that does have also something to do with you going to the, the girl that you're babysitting, going to her family and actually seeing wealth, seeing two living rooms, seeing, you know, the phrase, uh, we talk about it a lot at creative live that you can't be what you can't see. And yes. that's one of the reasons we, we try and put images of people who have discovered their passion, who are making the living and life for themselves um, that they that they want. And I'm wondering if, if this is me ascribing this to you, you can't be what you can't see, or if that was truly pivotal in in your in your transformation from someone who came from uh, a, a lack or less than uh, financially stable to someone who now is teaching about it. Yeah. No, I think that was a key part of the journey. And, you know, remember, I also saw it within my own family, right? Because while I don't think we were ever anywhere near wealthy, we were middle class enough to be able to buy property, which was very, like, that was not as common as it is now, uh, Mm -hmm. at least not where I'm from. Um, It was, you know, no no one I knew owned their own house, Yeah, in Queens, yeah, there's a lot of renting, yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's, yeah, it's expensive I think I had, place. Yeah, it is, and I think I had one good friend who her parents owned a condo, and I was always like, "Wow!" And I used to go like a couple blocks away to her house and like take the fancy elevator up. She had a doorman. Like <laughs> it was like always really fancy going to her house. So that was another. So like there were lots of examples, and for a short period of time you know, we went on vacation and like, this was like one of the few vacations that I ever went on as a child was during this short period, this condo that my parents bought. They were so proud. I remember inviting, like when I turned eight, I want to say I was like in second grade, uh, seven or eight. And I had a birthday party and this was our first time like inviting people over to this condo that my parents had bought. And I just felt so proud. You know, I just remember feeling that way. I had like my little birthday crown on, you know, the little paper crown you make in school. (laughs) With all the sparkle glitter on it. Like the Burger King one? (laughs) Yes, exactly, exactly. But this one was homemade. And, and, you know, all my friends came over. Because I think when I was in school, too, I suspected that, like, most of my peers had more than me, you know? And And that wasn't true. Like, there were definitely people who probably were at our same level. But I suspected, you know, that they had more than my close friends. And I could tell, like, their parents just, they just didn't seem to have the stress that we had. 
Um, and I remember also too going to the grocery store, having to use food stamps and being really embarrassed about it and wanting to like, like walk, I would walk all around the grocery store to make sure like none of my friends were there before I checked out. And then, you know, there was those one or two times where like somebody gets online behind you and you're like, ah, damn it, you know? Um, and so there was a lot of like, and this is why I want to talk about money with, with people, with women, with marginalized people, especially because it's like, we have so much shame if we don't have it. And then yeah. we have a lot of shame if we have too much. Right. Uh, and it's like, what is the perfect amount? And I think this is a, this is a, you know, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like this, this edge that, that women walk all the time of like, you know, you're, you're too skinny, you're too fat, you're too, you know, rich, you're too poor, you're, you know, everything is like, so scrutinized that like, where is the win, right? It's like, it's yeah. too much, or it's too little, and it's never just enough, right? Um, yeah. And so I'm just like, reject this entire idea, and and figure out what you want for yourself, and then trust that you can make that happen. Beautiful jumping off point from your past to now. I want to start off by saying congrats on your new book. We should all be millionaires. Uh, same publisher as I've got. They've done a great job with your book. Huge congratulations. That, that thing's Thank going you. straight to the top. Um, <laughs> but you just spoke of empowering women, m m uh, marginalized communities around the concept of being enough and dreaming. And I want to yes. double down on the dreaming part right now, because if you can't be what you can't see, it's hard to find great examples in our culture. You managed to cultivate a few. And now that you're trying to pass these attributes on this idea of being able to dream and then pursue those dreams, how do you know there right now, there's someone who's listening to the show. They're sitting on a park bench or walking or commuting, commuting and they're like, damn, I'm stuck. Like, I truly can't dream because I'm worried about, you know, my next house payment or not having a job or as we are trying to emerge from this, this economically devastating pandemic, like what, what advice would you give for people who are limited in their beliefs about themselves, their relationship to money and what's possible for them? Yeah. Well, I say, I say, first of all, dreaming is available to all of us. It is, it is free. You know, um, I, I think sometimes we fear that, but we have to be courageous. I think we're, some of times we're scared to like name our dream or really visualize it or write it down or say it out loud because it's just like, we're scared of the great disappointment or even pain of not having those dreams realized. Um, and that's what, you know, it does take some courage. It requires courage to really tap into your desires and be willing to commit to them and be willing to say like, I'm going to try it, even though it may end in great disappointment. Like, I think it's worth it. You know, uh, it's almost like love, right? It's like the same kind of thing where you enter into a relationship and you're like, Oh, if, you know, if I really let this person in, right, like it may not work out and I'll be heartbroken. And that's the same thing with, with our other dreams as well. But I think we have to be willing to do it because, you know, that's where it begins. And if you don't start that, right, you definitely lose. You definitely don't get to make it happen. And what if it could happen? I think the impossible is possible. So you got to just start with dreaming first. Do you, so, have, do you have some prescription? Yeah, keep going. This is great. Yeah. What, what's your prescription? You mentioned writing them down, sharing them publicly, uh, yes. what, what are some other things, things that you've specifically done? If you've got any stories or anecdotes, recommendations on how someone who I'll, I'll confess, like I, I wrote a best selling book and the first step is I it's, it's a four step process. Imagine design, execute, amplify, and imagining at different times in my life, I personally white male born in America, also lower middle class, but had, you know, never wanted for food, for example, and yet there have been times in my life, even in the not so distant past, where imagining what's possible was difficult. It was so, yeah. so, so, you know, just like trapped in my own head. And so if you, know, you, you want to speak and work with women in other marginalized communities who are disproportionately affected, how, what are some tools, some tactics that you can share for 
starting to be able to dream even in tough times? Yeah. So <laughs> as you would imagine, I start with calculating the dollars involved <laughs> because because I like to make it practical. I think sometimes we think, oh, I have to be a bajillionaire to ever like live the dream life that I want. And maybe, but let's put some actual real numbers around it because I think it makes it real, it makes it practical and makes it actionable. Um, so, you know, what I recommend that people do, and this is outlined in the book, but, you know, creating this million dollar vision, right? What I start with is, and, and, and how I came up with this action or this activity was, I used to go for a run in my neighborhood. I lived in a tiny two bedroom house with my husband and my three children. So like the three kids were in the master bedroom. We were in the guest bedroom and we were all sharing a bathroom and it was whatever. It is what it is. Right. And I was like shoved in the corner, like by the front door. So people would interrupt me all day long. This is me practicing law, you know, as an attorney. In fact, that's exactly where I lived when I went to do, go do creative live. Right. So like to put some timelines around it, <laughs> I was leaving my tiny little two bedroom in New Jersey to go to San Francisco and record it. Um, so that's where I lived. And so as you can imagine, we're like bursting at the seams. And so I would, and it was 1100 square feet just to give you some like square footage to two floors. So like half of that square, not half, but a good portion of that square footage was used for the steps. So <laughs> this is not a large house. <laughs> cottage, small cottage is probably how I would describe it. There you go. Uh, you know, so anyway, I used to go for a run or a walk in the neighborhood just to get out of my crazy house with all of the crazy people, right? And all of the stuff. Um, and so I would walk around the neighborhood and this was a nice affluent neighborhood. We just happened to have the tiniest house, you know, tiniest, oldest house in the neighborhood. Um, and so I would like run up and down the hill and there was like these neighborhoods that I really like to run or walk in. And there was this piece of property that was, you know, being worked on. It was being built and I would see it every day. And I was like, wow, this house looks like it's really beautiful. And then they started to get close to finishing it and they put up a for, for sale sign. And I was like, I allowed myself to like imagine that I could purchase that house. And so I was like, I'm going to run home and find out how much it is. You know, so I go to like whatever website, I think it was realtor.com, but maybe it was something else. And, you know, you know, go look it up, look up the, the street, like figure out what the address is or whatever and look it up. And it was like something like $3 million. I want to say like $2.7 million. I think it was. And I was just like, womp womp. You know, that was only, you know, I don't know, $2.4 million out of my budget. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was like down in the dumps and I was like, I'm just going to live in this tiny house forever, you know, and I'm just going to work my little heart out and I'm just going to have people ringing the bell all day while I'm trying to work and record and, and, you know, create videos and draft contracts or whatever. Um, and so I was, I was bummed out and my husband, you know, he's, <laughs> he's always the one to come along and be like, you know what, are you going to wallow or are you going to do something about it? You know, he's, he's not, he, he, he is compassionate, but his compassion has like a timeline. He's like, I got 24 hours of sympathy for you. <laughs> then I need you to get to work. So, uh, so, you know, then I, then I decided, you know what, you're right. Like, let me actually, maybe I can't afford that house, but what house could I afford and how much would it actually cost? And what isn't even a mortgage on a property like that? And so I decided to say, you know what, I'm going to write down and calculate what my dream life would cost. And so I looked up what was a mortgage on a million dollar house around 5k a month. Okay, 5k a month. Uh, what are so I want to put my kids in extracurricular activities that I can't afford right now. That's another $1,000 a month, right? I want to drive this kind of car. I want to travel. I want to be able to take care of my mom. I want to put this much in savings every month, right? And so I just calculated what is the monthly cost of the lifestyle that I actually want. And it came up to around $30,000 a month or $25,000 a month. So like $300,000 a year. And at the time I was probably making just under a hundred K a year. Uh, and I was the sole breadwinner. So a hundred K for my whole family. Um, and so, you know, I was like, okay, that's three X what I'm making right now. Like that's not that far away if I think about it, you yeah, know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm like, okay, let me start to imagine what could I do to make another, you know, 15K a month or 20K a month? Like, what could I do to make that additional money? And I start brainstorming, coming up with ideas. Um, and then, you know, from those ideas, a lot of them were really terrible and I didn't do them, but there were other ones that were pretty good and I tried them. 
and they were example just, example please example example so for for example um doing a, a workshop like teaching like a virtual workshop and saying i'm going to charge for it on legal stuff because that was my skill set and you know getting paid for it and that would bring in a certain amount of money okay cool that helped um, and at the time I had just finished, or it was around the time that I had created small business bodyguard, which I kind of taught about when I was at creative live. And so I was like, okay, well, how can I make money from this product? Like I launched it and made good money, but now it's like crickets. Right. So let me like try relaunching it. Let me do webinars. Let me try a YouTube channel. Like I would just try all these different marketing strategies to make, to bring money in. Then I tried selling trademarks from a webinar. No lawyer was doing that. It was like, you know, the only thing they sold from webinars was like digital products or courses. And I was like, I'm going to try selling my trademark services and see if I can get like five people to sign up. And that worked. Right. And so I just kept trying things to see what would work and see what would work consistently. And over time, it probably took me another two, three years to get to $300,000 in salary. Right. My business was doing okay, but I had to, so many expenses that what I took home was pretty minimal. And so I think just having that note in there. And then when I finally did arrive at that number, it's almost like I had forgotten about the note. So I went back, it was literally an iPhone note in my phone. And I went back and I looked and I was like, wow, I did all of that. I've accomplished all of that. And so then I was like, okay, it's time to make a new note. Now, what do you want? And so I just did it again. And so that's kind of what I do. I just do it again. Once I accomplish the things on the list, <laughs> it almost reminds me what's the, 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 um, the the girl from Game of Thrones that's uh the the oh. <laughs> you know the 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 badass one with the with the dagger I can't remember her name Arya Stark she had that list yes Stark <laughs> yeah so like basically my list was like actually you know things I wanted to be able to achieve you know and her list was kind of like that too it was kind of an achievement list as well just a different kind <laughs> <laughs> just a murder murderous list. <laughs> No, I, I think that the, the the practicality with which you approach that is heart, both heartwarming and empowering because there's what I find with most people having had, you know, a lot of folks on the show and talked with through Creative Live and through speeches and books and that the distance between where people are and where they want to be is often a lot smaller than we mm -hmm. think in our mind. Like exactly. I think, I think just actually writing it down and even if it's ten thousand hours or two hundred thousand dollars in your case, you're really only one decision away from mm -hmm. trying from trying to close that gap. You know, that decision exactly. to try, the decision to try is such a powerful one. Um, I agree. And even just researching, like even just, you know, daring to be like, okay, well let me look you know, what kind of house do I actually want? And seeing, okay, it's a million dollars. Let me do a mortgage calculator. How much does a, what do we, cause you're not paying a million dollars. You know, you don't have to come with a truckload of <laughs> with a million dollars in it. Right. You only, you need a 20% deposit. You need a monthly payment. Right. So yeah. figuring that out. And I think when you start to make it, we don't even allow ourselves to explore that. We just take ourselves out of the race. Um, yeah. And I will say too, for marginalized folks, for folks who grew up low income, right? For folks who are women, right? I think we just, we have zero tolerance for the, for the dreamy, for the non-practical. Cause we're just like, listen, that's, that sounds cute and all, but I need like real actual solutions, you know? Yeah. And so, I, and that's how I feel, right? I don't want to hear just like, and trust me, there is a place for woo. There is a place for dreaming as we've talked about, but I also need practical tips because I'm not going to go to the bank and get a loan. They're not going to give me one, right? There is no access to capital. I could barely get a credit card. Um, this is the struggle that I'm having. I can't seem to get a, a better job than what I've got going on, right? I need real practical steps to go from zero because that's where I'm at. Or for me, when I started, I was like negative. My net worth was like negative 100,000 because I <laughs> had all these law school loans, you know? So it's like, you start from that place. My credit score was like 450, you know, when I graduated from law school, I was not in good shape financially. Um, yeah. And, but I, I think we get so beat down by that. And it's like, no, 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 there are practical steps you can take, but it has to be practical. It has to be actionable. Otherwise it's just like, it's like, 
it feels like it's just for affluent people to talk to other affluent people and tell them how to feel good about themselves, you know? Um, and it's not really helping somebody who doesn't have those resources, who doesn't have a rich uncle. No one's going to come save me. There is no knight in shining armor. Tell me how to save myself, right? And that's what I aim to do in all of my work, because if it's not practical and useful, and if it's not making a real difference tangibly and hopefully quickly, you know, like in the next 90 days, preferably, um, it's, it's not useful for them, you know? Yeah, I, I'm thinking back to that, your description of living in that small 1100 square foot house where 250 of that was stairs. <laughs> But I, I, you were making such an impression. This is why, like, I think the decision to try is so important that you caught our attention at Creative Live. You had built up a practice and your your classic Creative Live around copyright, trademark for entrepreneurs, intellectual property rights. Like, yeah. to this day, it's a, it's a popular class. And that you were living in that situation and trying to escape for 30 minutes on a walk to, to walk past a house that you couldn't afford, but you wanted to dream like that. Hopefully, you know, that people can relate because all the people that you look up to on the internet right now, they have gone through hard times. They've had to do these basics, these, this, the concept of even dreaming, the concept of making a list of what would your dream like life look like? How much does it cost? And the fact that you were doing things and testing and experimenting including you know coming on creative live to like that that is so encouraging and i'm curious you know you mindset i'm a huge advocate of mindset I, i've got a little pyramid that i believe deeply in which is on the bottom of the pyramid is mindset and the middle is habits and on the top of that pyramid is goals and you can't get to either you know the second or the third step if you don't have some sort of a, a mindset, a foundation to build all this stuff on. And you early on in uh, my experience with your work, we're talking about mindset and specifically the mindset of money. And I wanted to uncover a couple things in the book, which I want to just pause for a second and say, this is an extraordinary book. Congratulations. We should all be millionaires, a woman's guide to earning more, building wealth and gaining economic power. Congrats, by the way. Thank you. But there's an idea in there that I loved, which is the juxtaposition between million dollar decisions and broke ass decisions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you know, and and why people may not even realize that they're focused on making broke ass decisions. And uh, you have a formula for dealing with that. But I'm wondering if you can just share because it's so tactical and there's a little bit of both humor and real embedded in that. Yes. 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 Um, yes. Because I think I realized, you know, it was around that same time after I had seen that house created that sort of calculation. Um, and that, that, that vision that I wanted that I was not treating myself very well. I had just had two babies back to back. Um, and you know, I was just kind of like still wearing old maternity clothes, hadn't had my hair cut in like two years. I was just in the grind of it, you know, and just like so determined and just working so hard and thinking, oh, I just need to keep working, right? And realize, you know, there's a certain point that you stop just throwing man hours at it and you have yeah. to actually get more strategic. Um, and I was still in that sort of space of trying to figure out the strategies um, and, and throwing so many hours at it. And, and I got inspired by a friend of mine who incidentally is a life coach to go get a haircut. And I was like, you know, she had talked about how like taking your care of yourself actually helps you make more money. And I was like, well, this sounds like nonsense, but I could really use a haircut. So I'm going to, I'm going to book it. <laughs> like, I'm going to go do it. I'm going to find some place and I'm going to go. So like, I went from New Jersey to Harlem, got my haircut, got my hair done. And I felt amazing. And it's like just that, that was a million dollar decision, right? Just spending that money to get my hair done, which was expensive, by the way. Like back in the day, like going to natural hair salons was like a new catchy thing for black women. And it was insanely expensive, it was like $200, right? For Which was crazy to me at the time. And so it was very expensive. It was an investment. And like just getting that haircut made me want to do more YouTube videos. It made me want to 
you know, show up more places. And maybe it was the YouTube videos that might have helped get me on Creative Live, which, which definitely helped me get in front of more people. I definitely wound up getting clients from that, you know? Um, yeah. And so I feel like when we take care of ourselves, when we invest in ourselves, that's when we start putting ourselves out there and making more money. So million dollar decisions are really about moving towards abundance, right? What makes your life bigger? How does it give you more of what you want? How does it expand your life versus broke ass decisions, which are all about contracting, saving, being really tight, you know, being scared to invest. Um, and I think honestly, that's how women are socialized around money. Men are told like, you know, uh, take risks, like go for it, like make it happen. And women are told, cut coupons, stop buying lattes, stop being a shopaholic. And we just get these messages that we're bad with money, you know? Um, yeah. And so that's why, you know, I developed this language around it, like million dollar decisions versus broke ass decisions. And the example that I like to give so that it's real practical for people. And this is, the, this is the gateway drug that I like start my clients with. <laughs> if I, once I get them on this path, then they're like, oh, wait a minute. There's more things. There's more, I can get there's it. more million dollars. I'm decisions. on it. Right. <laughs> Exactly. So the thing that I, that, and especially for women, especially for mothers, the thing, the main thing that I told, tell them to start with in terms of making a million dollar decision is laundry. Use a drop off service, spend the 70 bucks, send your laundry away. Don't spend your weekend doing laundry. Rest, relax, take care of yourself and come back on Monday ready to slay instead of, you know, doing all the things yourself, right? All the personal finance people teach like, do it yourself, save money, cut costs, right? Save as much as possible. And the evidence shows that those who focus on saving to become millionaires, it takes an, on average 32 years versus those who, you know, start businesses. It takes seven years to build $12 million in net worth. Those savers for 32 years, they build about 3 million. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to wait 30 years. <laughs> like, I want my millions now, you know? Um, and so instead of just always saving and always thinking that that's the only solution, sometimes it really is an investment decision, you know? And so making that investment of outsourcing laundry, when my clients start doing that and they get their like first batch of like folded laundry back and they're like, whoa, I didn't do that. And it just magically appeared <laughs> and it's clean. <laughs> it's like life changing. And then they're like, what else can I get off my plate? You know, what else could I stop doing? Where else could I bring my focus back to my earning potential? instead of always doing everything for everybody, you know? Um, so that's really what Million Dollar Decisions is about. And I do think that, you know, in order to become a millionaire, you have to be making million dollar decisions. And that the road is paved with million dollar decisions. You can't make broke ass decisions every day and think that that's going to bring more money in the door. There's some questions in the book that you pose to for people to like self-evaluate. Are they in the mental money jail Yes. I'm, I'm wondering if you can help some people who are, because right now I promise you there's someone listening and they're like, damn, she got me. Like, that's me. I'm trying to save my way into uh, financial abundance. And you know, you're not the only person who's, who, who shares this view that it's like, it's so much about mindset, but mm -hmm. I love the, I love the way that you you've given people a tool for understanding if, they are, in fact, their worst enemy. Talk to talk yes. to me a little bit about uh, you know some questions that whoever's listening right now and thinking that oh damn they got me they figured me out. Um, let's help those people self identify that they're they're in uh, mental money jail, uh, and then that'll convince them to shift gears. Yeah. So we have a, a framework called W. It's WSABM. We should all be millionaires and. And that's what I recommend that folks use to evaluate, am I making a million dollar decision here or am I making a broke ass decision here? And the W stands for what? Like, what do you actually want? Tap into your desires and figure out what do you actually want in this situation? Sometimes it's just too much society talk, too many, too many cooks in the kitchen, right? When you're evaluating a decision and getting too many different perspectives and now you don't even know what you want anymore. So what you want is what we start with. What the hell do you want? Um, and and being should. real about it, right? Like if yes. you want to, if you want that, you know, you want twenty thousand more a month in income so that you can live your dream life, then write down that damn twenty k. Exactly, and own it, right? And don't be yeah. ashamed because you want nice things. Like it's not a bad thing to want more in your life, in whatever way that looks like. So what do you want? And then the S is should, 
right? What are the shoulds that are operating here? What does society say you should do as a woman, as a person of color, as a man, right? Like whoever you are, you know, there's usually, oh, well, this is what I want to do, but what I should do is this other thing. And so identifying that and recognizing that that's not coming from within, it's coming from outside, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So actions, what are the action steps you would take if you wanted to get to your wants? Right. So what's just what's just the first action? Because I think sometimes, too, we're like, well, we're trying to imagine the entire pathway and create like this 72 point plan. And I'm like, can we just take the first step? Can we just see what happens if we just do step one? We don't need step 72 yet. We don't even know what that is yet. Let's just do step one and see what happens and evaluate from there and trust that you got it. Right. Um, And so that's a and then B is body. I always like to check in because I feel like if we, that's where the truth comes from. If we can really get centered and grounded and calm and check in with what our body is telling us, are we having heart palpitations and we're terrified, you know, or is there this impending sense of doom, right? Or is it something like you're so excited, like your palms are sweaty because you're just so excited imagining this happening. So checking in with what your body is pointing you to, you know, Um, because I truly believe like your body compass doesn't point you wrong. And I actually learned that from Martha Beck. Um, Mm. and then, um, and then the last one is for more, like, what does more look like for you? Right. Let's, let's lead towards more, whatever that is more of what you want and less of what you don't want. So that's, that's the framework, uh, to help folks to start to get into this. And I think once you start making million dollar decisions, you, you can't help but make them. And, and it is still scary. Like, it's not like there's no fear there. Sometimes when you're making investments in yourself, um, it's very scary. You don't know how it's going to work out. It requires faith. And there's no guarantee that it's going to work out. Uh, yeah. But I do think that those decisions and even the lessons that come from those those decisions really do take you where you want to go. So you mentioned your husband. You mentioned yes. your parents. Uh, I'm curious about your, your belief uh, around who you surround yourself with. How, how important is that for getting out of the mental money jail, how to, how to make million dollar decisions, how to, how to live like the millionaire that you are suggesting we should live like how important is it? People, people part. Yeah. Yeah. So I was on a a media show. I can't remember which one last year. And the first thing that this is like a two minute segment. So I have exactly, you know, 120 seconds. (laughs) tell to answer these questions and his first question was tell us how we can all become millionaires and my answer was get a better squad you know start with that if if there's one thing that you do like upgrade your squad you know and that doesn't mean only hang out with rich people because first of all a lot of us don't even know any rich people I certainly didn't know when I was when I was starting out but that's not what I mean what I mean is like get around encouragers. That's what my parents did for me. They had such enthusiasm for whatever crazy dream I was talking about as a kid. They were like, yeah, you could do that. Let's talk about how you could do that. Right. Like they were just so into it. So encouraging. They didn't have money, but they definitely had enthusiasm, you know? And so get yourself around folks like that who cheer for you, who uh, will say your name. Are you quitting friendships in order to get there? And how are you making these new friendships? How how, Give us the tactics on how to specifically. Yes. What what did you do to upgrade your squad? Well, I paid. I paid money. (laughs) So I joined a coaching community, uh, Pam Slim and Charlie Gilkey. They were my first, my very first coaches. And I discovered them from like some video and saw that they had a program. They, it was like $2,500. I had $500. I was like, well, I have the first payment. I'll figure out the rest later. I'm going to do it. And I joined. And we call it the family because Pam, Pam Slim is such a connector, you know? Pam and is such pa- a sweetheart. I love that human. She's amazing. Oh, she is probably the best human on earth. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and right so, up there. <laughs> exactly. And so all of the connections that she sort of brings together, we call it the family. And those folks that I met in that first coaching program have became, become dear friends, uh, clients, right? Uh, networking opportunities. My first paid speaking gig came from Pam Slim, right? Like, you know, Charlie taught me to sue my business partner who was taking advantage of me and I didn't even realize it. And he helped me to realize it and free myself of that. Right. So like those relationships that came out of there, not just with Pam and Charlie, but really everybody there 
uh, led to literally millions of dollars that I've made over that next decade. So you sometimes you got to pay to get into the right rooms, because if you grow up in a low income area, if you don't go to a top school, if you don't work at a Fortune 500 company, your network is not likely to be strong, according to statistics, which are like, hello, that's I qualify for all three of those. <laughs> so so sometimes you have to pay to get in the room, you know, and to get around those right people. And in terms of, you know, like my childhood friends are incredibly encouraging. They're they're not wealthy people. They're not even trying to become wealthy, but they believe in me. Right. And so it's really about getting the naysayers out of your ear. So if your you know cousin is always telling you like, you need to get a job. What are you thinking? Like, I, why are you making that decision? You're spending too much money. They're discouraging you. Get them out of your ear. That doesn't mean you have to cancel your cousin, but maybe don't talk to them every day. Maybe don't be in the group chat with them every day, right? And and really spend the most time with the people who really support you and, and help you and prop you up and make you believe, reinforce that belief because there are actual stats behind this. So this, this is not just like, Oh, it'd be right. nice to be surrounded by supporters. No, there are stats from, you know, Harvard professors that have studied this for decades that say that 95% of your success or failure is determined by who are you spending time with every day. So if you can spend time with people who encourage you every day, your success is 95% more likely to happen. And if you don't have access to that, like this, let this podcast that we're doing right here be a part of it. Like that's for, exactly. so, ma for so many people now access is, uh, is we, we've got access that we didn't have just five years ago to True. people like yourself. And if that's where it needs to start, if you can't afford 2,500, you don't have the initial 500 deposit to, to join Pam Slim's group. They start with what, you know, you're, you're feeding your mind, this muscle yeah. between our ears and, and I, you know, this idea of who you spend time with and, and positive folks right now, there are some people in your life that you probably got to quit. You don't need to walk up and, you know, and uh, just bail on them right to their face. But if it comes time to choose between, you know, listening to an empowering podcast or signing up for a networking group or, or hang around that old high school friend who's a downer, like those are choices that actually matter. And you just mentioned the, yes. the, the, the science behind it, right? 75 or 95% of yes. failure and success is who you spend time with. Absolutely. Um, so how does one, you, you've clearly uh, accelerated beyond that initial dream that you had of, um, you know, of living the life that you called the life of your dreams and you needed, you know, $28,500 to do that. So are there, is this just a process of doing the same exercise, reevaluating what you want next? You know, how do you, how do you continue to um, progress? Because, you know, if we don't set high enough goals for ourselves, then we're, you know, not reaching our potential. And if we set got goals that are too high for ourselves, then we're always left like just grasping at straws and not actually. Mm -hmm. So help us, help me, help me help the people at home here. Help, let, let's, let's moderate this for people so they can set goals that help them rather than do the opposite. Yeah. I actually think that, you know, wildly improbable goals are ideal, you know, um, and there's science behind this too. I'm a, I, I like to research. I'm a lawyer, so I always look for evidence. I don't like to just uh, talk about things or if I have a hunch about something, I want evidence, you know? I don't want to just, you know, because again, I want it to be practical and I want to know it works, right? <laughs> I want my best chance possible. And the science around goals does show that, you know, setting goals that are improbable but really exciting that that is more likely to happen than goals that are mediocre. Like if you're like, well, I'd like to increase my savings by 10% by the end of, you know, two years or whatever. It's like boring snooze fest, wah, right? Wah. It doesn't, it doesn't get you jumping out of bed. It doesn't get your blood pumping, you know, like you want to set a goal that's like, oh, can you imagine if we did that? You know, could you imagine if I accomplished that? You want that feeling. And when you get that feeling, that's gold, that's money. You know, yeah. because that's the kind of thing that gets you excited and gets you out of bed and gets you making calls and asking for the business and doing things you normally wouldn't do to make it happen. Um, and so I think that that is really important that we dream a little bigger 
and be willing to have these wild and probable goals and take people on the journey. I mean, we talked earlier about that million dollar month. This was the first month that I ever hit a million dollars, which which was June, 2020. And I shared that goal, right? Like we were, we were at like $650,000 for the month. Uh, we had like a huge pouring into a new offer we had created, which was a membership community. And I was like, we're so close to a million. Like, what if we went for a million? But I still was like, I was scared to, I was scared to say it to my team. And then I finally admitted it to my best friend, Robert Hartwell, like literally two days before the month ended and was like, I kind of want to shoot for a million, but I'm afraid. And he, you know, gave me a little pep talk and he's like, let me ask you a question. Like, do you want to hit a million? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, then go do it and stop talking to me about it. (laughs) You know? And I'm like, okay, fine. So I sent an email to my community and said, hey, we're really close to hitting a million. This would be an epic milestone. Like this is a win for all of us. Right. And so sharing it with them and saying like, here's two ways you can help us. You can either share it, spread the word about this new community that we've built or, you know, join us if you can. Uh, And if you can join us, join with the annual, because then that will help us get there further and just ask for, for the help. And the outpouring of support was insane. Like my community is why we hit a million, a million dollar month. We made $350,000 in 24 hours and hit one over a million that month. It was crazy. It was crazy. Um, So, and it taught me like, oh, people are rooting for you. People are here to support you. We just need to ask for help more. You know, we need to ask like, hey, can I be on your podcast? Hey, can you, you know, share this? Hey, will you, would you like to hire me? Here's what I can do for you, right? We need to ask for what we want. Again, this is like dreaming, you know, asking, like we have to be willing to put ourselves out there, risk something to make it happen. And if you've got a big goal and it's exciting to you, and especially if it's connected to something that's really important to you, I think those are the, those are the things that are going to make you go ask and, and push you to do those things that are scary. Tell me just, uh, I know I'm keeping you a little bit longer than I, I promised to, but there's good stuff flowing here. So I want to know a little bit more about Hello7 um, yes. for folks who are listening. And, uh, you know, I've already called out the book. I want to call it out one more time. Um, it's like, uh, it's, it's, I think an, I'll call it critical reading. Again, we should all be millionaires. A Woman's Guide to Earning More, Building Wealth, and Gaining Economic Power. This is not just a book for women. Um, this idea of economic power. Um, I think the lens that you put on it through, uh, for, through a women's, uh, lens, it was, was very powerful. I found it, I found it moving. Um, but let's understand a little bit more if we can about hello seven and by seven, you mean seven figures? Yes, correct. (laughs) Because you know what, here's the thing. I was, you know, an entrepreneur running a law practice. And, you know, I got it to like around 500,000. And then I started to kind of plateau. I was struggling to get it past that. I was like, what are the moves that I need to be making? What should I be doing? I don't even know. And there was nothing out there. There was like nothing teaching, you know, how to go from a couple hundred thousand to a million. Everything was like, get to six figures, get to six figures. And I'm like, I'm at six figures. And I could tell you like, when I pay my team, <laughs> pay all the expenses and pay my taxes, there's really not that le- that much left over for me, you know? So mm-hmm. I want to I want to do more. And so I would look to what were some examples of women who were making a million or even men, right? Who were talking mm-hmm. about it. Very few were, you know, talking about it. Probably not that many were doing it and really no one was teaching about it. And I do think there were like there were masterminds that were talking about this, but I didn't know about them or they were really geared towards men or geared towards tech space, right? I couldn't find anyone teaching about how do I get to a million? And I found that incredibly frustrating. So I I joined a bunch of masterminds that um, I was like the only woman. I was definitely the only black person, you know, it was like not ideal. I definitely learned a lot in those spaces, but they were not the most inclusive. And I definitely felt Uh, marginalized in some ways. There were sexist comments, racist comments. I mean, straight up sexual harassment in some of those spaces, you know? Uh, And I was like, okay, first of all, we we need to, we as women need to learn, know how to get to a million. Only 2% of women entrepreneurs ever build a seven figure business, right? 78% of women entrepreneurs never make more than 50K in annual revenue. And to me, that is a travesty and we need to fix it. Uh, and that's what Hello7 is out to do. 
Um, and so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to teach women how to make seven figures. And I wanted to do it in an environment that was inclusive and acknowledge their experience as mothers, acknowledge their reality as like not having as much access to capital, especially that included queer women, black women, you know, disabled women, right? Like we have actual challenges, yet we still want to do this, yet we're still ambitious. What, who can speak to us directly? Um, and so that's what we do at Hello7 is we kind of speak to everybody who's, who's not a white guy. <laughs> But we we do have some we do have some really great white guys in the community. <laughs> no, but that's a, like I, I'm trying to share this. To me, that's an opportunity to learn, to grow, and specifically yeah. the, like this idea of a rising tide floats all boats. If you want to put yourself, you, know, you want to give yourself the opportunity, you got to try and put yourself in in the ring. Give yourself an opportunity to win. And yes. I think you're a shining example of if you don't see it, you got to build it. And, right. you know, that is incredibly inspiring from whatever your background. Um, you know, what's so funny. I, 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 this is the story of my life. Like I didn't see it and it was frustrating me. And I had been looking for years and even asked people create it. You should create this. I would buy it, you know, and they didn't. And so I was like, fine, I guess I'll have to do it. And it's the same <laughs> thing with this book, like, you know, looking for black women, women of color, women of color are the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs. And yet there's no business books that are specifically geared towards them. And I was like, this is ridiculous. And I'm like, fine, I guess I'll do it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's kind of like, that's what I'm always the reluctant, you know, shouldn't somebody be doing this? And then I just, find that, okay, the message is, I guess I'm going to have to fill those shoes. And I think sometimes it's like that imposter syndrome we don't feel adequate to. Like, can I really teach this? Can I really help this? And I think the answer is yes for all of those listening. And yeah, go create those things. Go fill those gaps because there are so many. So true. And I want to I want to close with what I find to be a really important idea. We talked about it before we started recording. Uh, and you brought it up as a, as an important area of focus. And that is this idea that we want wealth and success overnight and that we mm -hmm. want to go as big as possible. And yet if you deconstruct the success of the people that we look up to admire, respect, appreciate in, in whoever, whatever community you're looking at, they didn't do it that way. And yet there's this belief. I don't know if it's the internet or God dang Instagram or I don't know what it is. It's it is the this. internet. It's definitely the it, internet. It, <laughs> but, but, and, and I you also shared that that was something that creative live, your experience teaching on the platform uh, had helped, helped shine a light on. And I'm wondering if you can articulate that, like where'd you start out and why is it sort of counterintuitive? How does it work? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I learned when I came to Creative Live is that, you know, y'all started with photography. That was that was a focus. You had a niche and then you expanded from there. And and I realized like when I started to look at what are who are the businesses that are wildly successful that I'm following? And when I look at them, they're selling one thing or they're focused on one market, you know? And I'm like, "Oh, I'm seeing a, a trend here that they're really narrowly focused." And then that's what gets them to millions and multi-millions. Cool. Maybe I need to do that, right? Because what I was doing in my business was just launching something new every time I needed money, right? So like every couple weeks, I was like coming up with something else to sell, not narrowing it down. So I was very busy, very tired, talking to different types of audiences and wearing myself out and also unable to create like the process and systems that are so important for business so that you can be efficient um, yeah. and make more money, right? And also confusing messages for your audience. If you're talking about all these different things, they're like, okay, I don't even know what you can help me with, right? And yeah. so that's one of that, coming to Creative Live really planted that seed for me. And that has become such an anchor piece of what I teach. You know, my, my clients know <laughs> we have a program called We Should All Be Millionaires, the club, it's the community. And they know I am relentless about this. And they're like, fine, fine, we'll listen to you. But I tell them, you need to have a single flagship offer. You know, what is your one offer? What is your one ideal client? How can you really focus? Hit a million by focusing. You'll get there so much faster. You'll be able to create systems. You'll be able to create a streamlined marketing strategy to sell that one offer to that one type of client. And then 
you know, once you hit a million or, or multi millions, if you want to complicate things, do it right. Like then you can sort of broaden out and, and you're, you have the team, you have the money, you can invest in making that happen. Right. And serving more than one audience. But when you are a scrappy solopreneur, like, why are you selling 12 things? <laughs> Overcomplicating yeah. it and really watering down your genius, you know? So, um, I'm surprised more people don't teach this. It is is shocking to me uh, that it's not more common. You know, I know we talk a lot about niche, but I think even within niche, people still have seven different offers. And it's like, why can we just set, we can make a million with one, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Focus is incredible. The, the idea of mastering a thing and then it's in, mm -hmm. in mastering the thing, you learn so much about mastery in and of itself that you start to yes. be able to understand what it looks like and feels like, see it in other places and be able to leverage that into your next thing and your next thing. I think everybody wants yes. to be, you know, get do the 80 20 rule and, you know, do it, get yourselves 80% of the way there. But then you miss that. That last step is where all the best shit is. Yes. And um, also too, speaking of mastery, right? If you sell yeah. one thing, and you're forced, for, forced to show up every day finding more ways to sell it, you get really good at selling that thing. You get really good at marketing that thing. You get so much more confident around that. Um, and you even get better at like delivering it, at, at delivering that expertise or delivering that product. So I think it's a missed opportunity for so many. So I'm glad you, you brought that up so we could share it. Rachel Rogers, thank you so much for being on the show, for being a shining light to so many. Congratulations on the new book. And if you haven't uh, written it down yet, if you're listening and, wa or, and are watching, we should all be millionaires, a woman's guide to earning more, building wealth and gaining economic power. It's out now. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Where, just before we go, uh, is there anywhere that you would steer people in particular, some coordinates on the internet where besides supporting you by, by buying the book, uh, anywhere else you'd like to point our, our people? Yeah. Uh, you get, I hang out on Instagram a lot, you know, shouting about money. So <laughs> you can, <laughs> you can, uh, you can follow me there at Rach Rogers ESQ. And if you want to see my family's crazy antics with, we, we live on a ranch with horses and, you know, my wild children are running around the ranch all day. If you want to see those, that's the ones the behind Rogers you. Ranch. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like, gosh, look at that. So beautiful. Again, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, I'm grateful for you and your work. And thank you for being such a beacon uh, in the community. Uh, and for everyone out there, please support Rachel, her new book. Uh, she's got an amazing class on Creative Live about intellectual property for entrepreneurs, selling ideas, licensing. Um, it's very, very well reviewed, 100% positive thumbs ups there with thousands of students. So thank you so much for being on the show, Rachel. Until next time, everybody out there in the universe, I bid you all adieu.